build a brain, build a brain. Once you learn to do it, you were never the same. Build a brain, build a brain. On purpose! With Brain Broad. Welcome to today's episode of the Brain Broad Builds a Brain with author, speaker, clinician, teacher, and show host Lynette Louise. Every episode focuses on how to help a different brain disorder. Lynette Louise is the perfect guide to share that information because our brainy broad flies abroad, working hands-on all over the world to improve the lives of people with a variety of brain dysfunctions. Lynette is doubly board certified in neurofeedback and actively pursuing a PhD in psychophysiology. Okie dokie, okie dokie, okie dokie. You are listening to The Brain Broad Builds a Brain. I am The Brain Broad, otherwise known as Lynette Louise. That's my actual name. My actual name is Lynette Louise. So if you're Googling me and you want to know anything about me, you can try either one. They'll both get you to me. Lynette Louise, though, I think there is another woman who's got the name Lynette Louise and just that's it, no other surname just like me. And so if you read about me already being dead, I'm not. Okay, so I'm here, I'm alive, I'm not dead. Okay, um, I'm the Brain Broad. I help people at home and abroad. A lot of people ask me, why do you call yourself abroad? That's like bringing down your brand. It's making you sound like a, uh, you know, like a tough, old, feisty English woman singing in a bar. Well, I have done that to make a living on occasion, although I was never a tough, old English woman. I was definitely a Canadian in singing in a bar trying to raise my kids and paying the bills. So I think broad fits. Um, also, I like the word because it can be played with in the sense of being a, someone who travels abroad, working with a variety of brain-based challenges, you know, and a sort of a broad-based practice, helping people with a broad array of brain differences, struggling to function better and our show's all about that our show's about you know believing and knowing and understanding the brain's plasticity about knowing that when you do something that's what you build stronger in your brain so if you sit around chewing your nails man you have a great representation in the brain of how to chew nails may not be the best <laughs> the best habit formation you ever did but you'll be good at it so the point is brains grow brains diminish. It's all up to you which way they go. If they're going to get bigger and stronger in, in, in any area, then that's what you got to focus on. That's what you got to do. And we have a fantastic guest to talk about that. So today, oh, oh, and don't forget, don't forget, you want to stay to the very end of the show. I think today we're going to have time to do the brain brought us the Google gods. How do you fix that? So we'll either, you know, look up something for fixing or we'll look up something for, um, you know, a definition that is brought up during the show. Or perhaps we'll even talk about how you properly search on the Internet so that you don't end up always getting sort of a reflection of yourself given back to you. Because the more the algorithms get sophisticated, the more that you are taught to see a world via the Internet that is just a reflection of your own interests. And it's a form of lying to you that you want to be able to sort of get out of the feedback loop of. Otherwise, you are completely misinformed as you move forward, and the Internet gives you an opportunity to be informed. So we want to, we want to use that properly. Okay, so remember to stay to the end of the show to get a, a handle on that. Um, if the show's short, you'll get to hear one of my songs. That's always fun. And uh, I'll also give you a little bit of uh, biofeedback advice on what I might do to help with memory. Because today we are going to be talking to Dave Newman, M.A., so he has a master's. And he's got a background in psychology and the creative arts from New York University. He currently runs two small businesses. One to help people with memory issues called Memory Matters, and that ends with a Z. And by the way, that's what we're going to focus on. And the other is called South Florida Biofeedback. Oh, no mystery how I found him. <laughs> He's in the same, same world as I am. And by the way, before I continue to read his intro, I want to tell you that this is a man who really gets about the Internet and is super supportive, super busy informing everyone and connecting everyone and um, I just really appreciate him because he's been extremely supportive to me and my causes and my work. So much appreciation goes to him for that. Um, and so should you, because 
you know, you're my peeps here listening to the show. Okay, um, he, so his other business is Biofeedback. He works there as a life coach. His greatest pride in life, however, is his awesome 10 year old daughter named Adeline. I'm going to ask him how to pronounce it. It looks like Adeline, um, who will be listening. So, hello, Adeline or Adeline. Uh, thank you for listening. Adeline. <laughs> Adeline, yay. Thanks. It's like Madeline. Thanks, Lynette. <laughs> you're welcome. Thanks, Lynette. And you are an awesome hero to me. Uh, and I'm so thankful for the amazing work you do. Uh, oh, you are a credit to our community in the best way. And oh. um, thank you for giving me a chance to talk about memory, which is something I'm very passionate about, and moved to South Florida to engage with the mecca of bad memory, you could say. Uh, it seems a lot of <laughs> elders move here, and you know most have memory issues. A long time ago, I worked in a nursing home where uh, I witnessed the the higher-end nursing home not providing support for uh, people who are older. And so what happened was they, they would turn senile very quickly. Dementia would just rush in. And I vowed one day to be able to, to hope to be able to do something uh, about it. And so the day has come. And... I've read every possible book you can imagine on memory and discovered that there's literally hundreds of things you can do to improve your memory at any age and that most people do almost none of them. <laughs> and, you know, they talk about a an epidemic of Alzheimer's and dementia, which we do have, but much of it could be uh, stopped and reversed even if people took a lot of proactive measures. So I would love to talk about some of those with you. I would love that. Can we start with something? What about Alzheimer's and dementia? So many people are, you know, they use the terms interchangeably. Other people ask, you know, what's the difference between the two? What's your opinion on that? Well, the more I learned about memory, the more I I came to understand that it's a very complicated issue. It's similar to cancer in that, There's literally hundreds of types of memory. They've identified almost 300 separate types of memory. And so memory fails individually uh, for people. There are certain things that fail, you know, um, across the board. But most things, um, in, in terms of individuality, we have our own separate profile of memory dysfunction. So, So the first step is to understand what sort of memory problems you're having. With Alzheimer's, they have yet to even identify what Alzheimer's is, unless someone dies and then they can genetically figure out this is Alzheimer's. But basically, Alzheimer's is, is, and dementia are, are massive failures of memory uh, that, that grow over time. And at a certain point, we, we call it Alzheimer's or we call it dementia. But it starts young, and there's people uh, in their 20s that, that are having memory issues or even younger now. So, so, uh, the causes are surprising. And, oh, that's and interesting. uh, so is there a, is early onset growing then? Yes, absolutely. Uh, from age 30 on, our brain starts to slowly get more and more, um, well, you could think of it in terms of the computer, the processing speed slows down over time, other parts of the memory, such as wisdom, grow. And in our culture here, we don't value those parts. Are Alzheimer's and dementia, is, is it on the rise? Is it increasing? Um, yes, there's a huge epidemic, as they call it, in the U.S. and globally. But it seems that much of it can be prevented and even turned around if we take uh, proper measures, especially proactive ones. So uh, it's a complicated issue. And well, okay, so what, are, what, what would be proper measures, proactive ones? I mean, if it's starting at an onset of 20 years old, that's kind of scary. So right, let's talk right. about what people can do. It's an amazing thing. I, I, the common denominator, denominator seems to be similar to heart issues. So everything that affects the heart affects the brain that much more because of the blood flow. 
um, which is greater. And so if you look at your lifestyle and you do all the things that you know about helping your heart and apply those to your brain, you can, you can reverse much of it. So exercise, eating low-fat, uh, you know, local, organic, vegan uh, food. It's, there's a lot of fatty buildup in the brain that causes many of the dysfunction uh, types. And using your brain, think of it, thinking of it as a gym where you work it out in different ways. So people talk about brain training, um, and there's been limited success in terms of helping with particular issues is good with brain training, but they haven't, they haven't yet figured out how to get it into the working fluid memory so that it cuts across the borders and we don't lose our keys, for example. So they still have a lot of work to do if it's ever going to get there. Um, so basically... Changing your lifestyle, lowering your stress is huge. The, the more stress we have, the greater the memory issues are. Um, those are some of the big ones. So I'm curious about something you mentioned. Let's talk about fats for a minute because mm -hmm. um, so often people are told, you know, that they should be taking their fatty acids. And uh, what's the difference between what you're referring to as, you know, fat in the brain and the healthy fats? Right. So lately there's been more and more studies about the Mediterranean diet with the olive oils and the good fats. And apparently they are somewhat help, helpful um, in terms of not causing uh, stickiness or clotting within the, the blood supply in our body. But other people like Dean Ornish um, don't agree with that and they would recommend much lower fats and you know, they, they look at the Mediterranean diet as a middle ground at best. So I tend to I tend to be on that side of the of the you know coin. I I've, there's an excellent documentary called Fat Sick and Nearly Dead, which you can watch on the internet or through through Netflix, which illustrates uh, a person who changes their lifestyle and within two months literally morphs into a new human being. And it's, and it's using all of that advice. But what's amazing about the documentary is that you witness it over an eight-week period. Someone literally, you know, cuts their, their size in half, gets rid of all their medication, and, you know, literally glows and their brain is clear and you can see all of this. So uh, that's one of my favorites. I think they should show that's it in awesome. school every year. Can you say the name again? <laughs> Fat, sick, and nearly dead. A guy named Joe Cross, C R O S S, was a, a wealthy Australian banker who decided that he wanted to cure himself, and so he did this sort of diet lifestyle change and made a documentary of it. And it's also unique in that he didn't do it to make money, he was a rich guy already. So it was a real public service, uh, you know, effort. And and the problem is that most people have huge trouble making these sorts of changes because our society completely contradicts, you know, this way of living. And having come to Florida, I see the television, and one one TV advertisement is for junk food that causes all these problems, whether brain or heart. The next commercial is for a medication, you know, often with fatal side effects that, um, you know, that is supposed to cure it. So we're bombarded with a social atmosphere that makes it very difficult to, to make these type of changes. Right, right. And then in, in that concept of, uh, you know, media sort of misinforming us and giving us sort of an, <laughs> a craving to go and have something that has absolutely no nutritional value in it but will get you salivating um, on that question of fats versus fatty acids. I just want to, uh, for clarity for the audience, that fats are different than fatty acids and that the fatty acids are actually subunits of fat. So it's a different thing. And just because it has the word fat at the beginning doesn't mean it's the same. So if you're taking um, a supplement in order to make sure you have your fatty acids, you're doing something very different than making a fatty brain. Um, do you agree with that? 
Yeah, I do. I I think it's um, in well in the documentary they divide it into what they call micronutrients and macronutrients. The micronutrients are uh, legumes, beans, or vegetables or fruits, um, and and you know it's very basic diet, uh, whole whole foods, local, organic, if possible. And and then the macronutrients are essentially everything else, um, and it, it I like to think of it like that because it simplifies uh, something that can be terrifically complicated. Right. Uh, right. So and I like that too. That much easier for somebody else to sort of take action on. So all right. So here you are. You're in the mecca of <laughs> of memory <laughs> problems. Um, do you separate when you when you're meeting people in your you know sort of in your surrounding area? Do you separate out this one is dementia, this one is Alzheimer's, this one is just memory, or is it all the same thing? You just go, I'm, we're working with memory and we're going to work on memory. It sort of depends. Uh, the the company has a bunch of different offerings that we do. So sometimes there's classes that are like yoga classes, and and other times there's individual memory profiling which which with the one on one work is is all based on the idea that we have our individual memory profile you know of dis, of dysfunction essentially and in order to really help with our problem we need to understand exactly how we're being affected by it and then we can figure out ways to counter it so it depends on one aspect of the business but in general it's a you know it's a mission to to help people on all levels but i suppose the most interesting part is the individual you know the individual coaching so right right okay so do you have um any actually before we do that i was going to ask you what got you involved in memory and why the interest in memory but before i do that i want to tell everyone build the brain build the brain once you learn to do it you will never the same Build a brain, build a brain on purpose with Brain Broad. You're listening to The Brain Broad Builds a Brain. I am, I am the Brain Broad. Uh, my actual name, though, is Lynette Louise. Lynette Louise is my actual name. We are always talking about how we build our brain bigger or how we let it build smaller and shrink away from us because we're not giving it enough attention. Nutritionally, uh, exercise, uh, fresh air, whatever it is that we have to do in order to change our personal functioning. Uh, I'm going to come off this break and ask a couple of questions uh, of our guest, Dave Newman, who we are speaking with um, about memory, because he does have a company called Memory Matters, and that ends with a Z. But before we get there, I want to remind you to stay to the very end of the show where you're going to kind of take a little journey with me into, I think we'll go into Alzheimer's a little bit and look at what's what's new on that front. We'll do a little, the brain brought us the Google gods. How do you fix that? We'll see what's new on that front and if there's any extra information that we can share. Um, and also I'll give you a little bit of what I would do if I was working on somebody for memory with uh, biofeedback for the brain. So this will be fun. Coming off the break with Dave Newman. Thank you for waiting while I go blah, 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 blah. And uh, so how did you get into this? Um, well, like a lot of things with, with all of us, you know, individual stories are so important. And in my case, I, I was working at a nursing home in, uh, in affluent New Jersey, and it was uh, a, supposedly a very good nursing home. And one day a guy named Max came, and it was his first day, and he was a very sharp guy. He drove in, and he'd been a businessman his whole life, and just retired, and and came in, and and I I watched Max and became friends with Max, and and there was literally no stimulation uh, except for bingo on Tuesday nights in at this place, and so sadly Max, you know, found himself in a very vacuous setting. He quickly stopped driving. You know, he stopped engaging uh, with people bit by bit, although he would open the door for people as they came in the nursing home, and he sort of became the unofficial doorman of the place. But over just a, a two- or three-month period, 
I watched and observed Max going from a very sharp, together guy into what would be called severe dementia, um, who could, you know, function just barely. And it, w it seemed to me that it was entirely based on the environment, and, and it just was heartbreaking. And at the time, I didn't quite realize, you know, the, the dimensions of what was going on because I was in my early 20s. Um, but, but I did really, really hope at some point to be able to get into that world and, and do what I could to help with those sorts of people and problems. And after entering the world of biofeedback, um, previous to that, to that, I had been a counselor at NYU for helping students for 23 years. So I was sort of sick of <laughs> young kids as much as I love them. <laughs> um, but, but going in, into the world of dealing with elders seemed amazing. I had been doing biofeedback work, as you know, for the uh, .org, uh, directing the NRBS. And I noticed a lot of my colleagues like you specializing in different aspects of helping people. Uh, and so I thought memory can be my niche. And so that was seven years ago. And since then, I've been a student of memory as much as uh, I could be and read hundreds of books and sort of figured out all these common denominators over time that people seem to agree about. And there's a lot, you know, as you know, that's unknown. But uh, it was astounding to learn that what we hear, similar to, you know, the, the cultural messages for eating junk food and what we know objectively in terms of our, our medical knowledge is worlds apart. And so, you know, it became obvious that being an activist towards helping people with these lifestyle changes, which are much of the, uh, you know, involved with many of the issues of memory problems would be a good thing. So Yeah, a very good thing. So if you were to pare it down to, say, five tips, what would you come up with? Um, on the well, spot the, right now, <laughs> on the hot one seat. Of, one of the <laughs> easiest, you could call it a cheap trick, is to drink a ton of water. If you, if you drink a quart of water a day, you, you, you can't do yourself wrong. It thins the blood supply so that you, you, um, your, when your blood is thinner, it flows much better. And most people don't drink nearly enough water. So it's a really easy trick to start the day with 30 gulps of water or two huge glasses of water and, you know, keep it going. And, and, and I realized the importance of that one time when I was giving blood. And for the first time in my life, blood didn't come out. And the nurse said, you know, did you drink water today? Or, and I said, not yet. And she gave me a big glass of water. And within a few minutes, it spurted out. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. So water is one. Yeah, you know, I'm going to interrupt you on that with my own little story. So I went through a couple of years where it was a huge deal to take blood. And since I have a thyroid issue, they would be wanting to take blood. And we'd, like, hang my arm down. And they'd talk about how my blood is like tar. And we'd go through all this over and over and over again. And then I'm at a conference, and I said, oh, I need a coffee. And she said, why don't you just have water? That'll wake you up. And I got... Whatever, water's not going to wake me up. So I go, <laughs> I go and I down a couple bottles of water just as an experiment because I'm always open to that kind of learning, even if I did resist initially. And sure enough, I felt more alert and started drinking water. And the next time I went to have my blood taken, it just flowed no problem. So here, yeah, you, you know, how can it not be affecting your health to have it like tar versus to have it fluid? Right, it's and it's such a simple thing. It's it's really, you know, the worst case scenario, you have to go to the bathroom more. I mean, that's like, <laughs> you know, right, that's, exactly. that's a great problem. So so that's one. Okay, number two. Number two, I would say, is physical exercise. You know, start walking, and, you know, the, the more the merrier. The, if, if you can walk an hour a day, you, you'll, you'll get yourself in aerobic condition, and, you know, that will, again, help your blood flow, it'll wake you up, it'll, it'll boost your memory, 
all sorts of good chemicals come shooting out, and it's a you know it's crucial. Um, number okay, three. I'm going to interrupt you again. Okay, okay, and when you walk 30 minutes a day, what you'll do is also you'll release brain neurotrophic healing factor, which adds your ability to grow your brain instead of have it shrink. Go on. Mm-hmm. Um, number three would be to to do the dietary changes, which which is probably the most torturous one for most people because, again, everything is against it. But if you can get a group uh, together or a friend to do it with you, you, you can't, um, you know, you can, you can do it. Look at it as a, as a long-time, lifetime plan. Learn to value that type of eating in terms of taking care of yourself and nurturing yourself as as better than the quick, you know, fix of the, cocaine-like high of getting sugar, fat, and salt, which I call the trilogy of evil, you know, that the <laughs> most foods are, are packed with. Um, so, so wait, so what do you suggest? I heard you mention vegan before. So what is your suggestion on what they should do to make their dietary changes? Well, I would recommend every year people watch Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And, and again, the macronutrients and the micronutrients so the micronutrients, uh, the, the fruits, vegetables, uh, nuts, and beans are the four food groups that you should be eating primarily. You, when you eat like that, you don't have to worry about, you know, how much or when. You, you can, you, can uh, you know, it's, they're so abysmally healthy that, that it's basically all you have to do is, is eat when you feel like it and stop when you're done. And, and then if you eat... 80% of your, your food like that, it, it's so good for you that it doesn't seem to really matter what the other 20% is. So that means that two out of 10 meals, you can eat you know, McDonald's if you're inclined. You know, so it, it allows you to take part in the dysfunctional you know, realm of <laughs> eating in, a, in our culture. Right. With, without uh, going crazy because we're often stuck in these type of situations. And I, that's what I would recommend. And I know it's terrifically hard, so I, I think it's best to look at it as a lifetime plan, no matter what your age is, because it's going to be a process. Okay, all right. So that's, we've got eating, walking, drinking water. Uh, two more. The next one is to think of your mind as a gym. So you want to exercise it at the gym. <laughs> um, so you want to do different activities that will essentially build neurons. Every time you have a thought, a new thought, every time you learn something, you're literally growing a neuron. So, so the more and different sorts of things you can do to exercise your brain, the, the more neurons you'll grow, the more you'll be able to reverse and stop the memory damage. If you have particular issues, like say your driving is getting a little funny, you're older, they have software in the brain training industry now with uh, luminosity and whatnot, which is it's very good for particular things like helping you drive better because it trains those particular tasks. Don't think that that will help you across the board with the fluid memory, though. But, but um, you know, you the, you learning is the key. So always learning always looking at yourself as a lifelong learner. learner. Learning is not something for school. You know, the end of education is when you love to learn. It's not getting a degree or a diploma. And, and if you can look at it like that, you, you'll keep your brain in optimal uh, fitness. And once you've learned it, it doesn't help to keep doing it because you've built the structures, you've, you've built the neurons that can do it, so you want to learn something else. So you want to keep learning different things as you go through life. And that's the best advice I've read uh, across the board. People seem to agree on these types of things. Um, and, and yeah, I think I've, that, In fact, one of the things that I've read many times is one of the best preventatives for Alzheimer's or dementia is to have been somebody who is constantly curious and constantly learning. Um, that's right, so there yeah. must be, yeah. Must be something to that. Okay, and the last mm-hmm. one? Last one is stress, stress management. Uh, we can't always control stress that easily. You know, life throws down, you know, salt on us, and, 
and, and everyone gets stressed in a greater or lesser uh, way, but we can do lots of things to be both proactive and in the moment to give us tools to help. As, as you know, Lynette, with biofeedback, a lot of it is the, the proactive part and a lot of it is in the moment uh, parts. So daily rituals like exercise, like meditation or praying if you're inclined in that direction or uh, breathing is a huge one. I think everyone should be taking deep, slow belly breaths, you know, for, for an hour a day, you know, and whenever they feel stressed, do it an hour in advance, you know, before they have that big conference and, and they'll come in the happiest, calmest person in the room. Uh, so stress management is, is one of the biggest problems that leads to memory dysfunction as well. So those Very would be the top five off the top of my head. Very cool. I love those. Um, on breathing, I first read the stats on, and now this may be different because this is an old statistic from an old neuro, uh, neuroanatomy class, but uh, there was a stat on the degree to which anxiety was actually caused by breathing dysfunction, and it was in the 90s. Imagine that. So instead of instead of getting a generalized anxiety drug to control it, you could have just settled out, belly breathed, taken it nice and slow, and and you know equalized the oxygen carbon dioxide content in your blood properly so that it didn't cascade into all of these symptoms of anxiety, which then you know have informed your brain and your and you had a panic attack so right right so and also breathe. blood pressure it's great for you know if you're getting white coat syndrome and you go to the doctor you know do that breathing in advance and it'll lower tremendously not like one or two points like garlic but you, you know you're talking 30 points 20 points you know when you, that's the type of difference uh breathing makes i i think a lot of people might get diagnosed with with high blood pressure because they get so stressed when they're, you know, <laughs> treated like... Right, right, when they're on their way into the doctor. And then on the, on the idea of memory and focus, if you're anxious, what you're thinking about is internal. You know, you're sort of, you're sort of perseverating or circle thinking inside and panicking and nothing can come in and you have all this or, or out, <laughs> right? So, of course, you can't access your memories. That's right, and I would I would love to hear some of your ideas about memory to apply what I'm talking about, and actually to add a sixth thing, which is social engagement. You know, if you can uh, be around people and engage with life more, there's there's nothing better for your memory. A lot of elders isolate themselves, and you know, talking to people, being in groups, uh, is a great way to to help your memory also. So on that note, I would ask you, from your background in physiology and biofeedback, how do you help people with memory? Well, just to put a sort of a, a period on this sentence of what you just brought up, there is something that you know researchers call enriched environment experience-dependent plasticity. So um, for folks who don't know what enriched environment is, I want to give you sort of a little definition. A lot of times people think, well, you know, it's so chaotic in my home, I have an enriched environment. Well, there's a place where a lot of variety but is enriched. So you have an environment where you, you have a lot of social engagement, a lot of surprises in social engagement. You can't know what someone else is going to do, so you're constantly having to sort of respond according to what somebody says, what they do, and being with other people is sort of a constant variety-driven thing. That's enriching. But if you have chaos, which is taking that and turning it up so high <laughs> that you're kind of in fear, you're kind of feeling uncertain all the time, you're afraid uh, because you never know, is he going to is he gonna yell, is he going to... That's chaos, and that doesn't enrich. So if you're in... Just to be clear, so in an enriched environment... You can't have as much enrichment by changing your furniture around as you can have by being engaged with other people. The more you're around other people, the more that you are constantly having to assess a new element, respond to a new thought, think, you know, learn a new thing. And there's kind of a 
constant influx of this variety of education that we were talking about. And so I believe strongly that being engaged with other people is very enriching and really guides neuroplasticity and helps memory. But if you're tanked on it, if you're exhausted by it because you're now processing at a different rate or whatever, then you've got to take breaks. You can't say to yourself, I'm enriching, I'm enriching, <laughs> and push yourself to the point where it becomes stressful. So I believe that memory, like all brain function, is very related to the dance of life and the way in which we honor our own needs. And we go, you know, at this point, it's stressful, so I'm going to push myself for another few minutes and then give myself a rest. Pushing is important because when you're learning beyond the edges of your ability, it's a little uncomfortable, but you don't want to push long. Like, like being in a gym. I love the gym analogy. If you're in a gym, you push your muscles for an extra couple reps, but you don't push them so hard that you rip them. If you do, then you've got a long period of healing, so you've done damage. So the way that I help people is the primary thing I do, and it's almost with across the board with all brain challenges, is I help them to get very aware of who they are and where their challenges are and where their edges are and how to push themselves only enough to make it beneficial. This also makes them better at reporting to me their benefits, and then I can... Um, I can move the sensor around to the place where it's most connected to. So if you want to stay with me right now, I'll, I'll just go ahead. Usually I say goodbye to the guests and go into the biofeedback thing, but you gave me this great opening, so I'll do that right now, and then you and I can talk about it. How does that sound? I would love it, yeah. I, okay, great. awesome. Yeah. So you mentioned something about, um, you mentioned about the, the losing your keys. So let's go with that one because it's a really typical one that we all do for a variety of reasons. If you're stressed and you're worried about, let's say you've got an appointment coming up and you're stressed when you put down your keys, and because you were stressed you did something in a different order, so you're, it's called procedural memory where your body does stuff without you sort of attending to it mm -hmm. because you've practiced it so much. Some people call it muscle memory. So if you put your keys in a new spot without paying attention to that, without noticing because you were stressing and you did things in a different order for some reason. Maybe the floor was wet when you came in, so you naturally stepped around it. Now you're in a different spot. You put your keys in a new place. You didn't pay attention. You have no idea where your keys are. Your body might, <laughs> but you don't, believe it or not. You, if you lay off of stressing, I used to have this trick where I'd say, okay, spirits, I have, you've got 24 hours to give me back my keys. Sure enough. <laughs> At some point, because I laid off, my body memory would take me to my keys. Sometimes it comes like, a, oh, I know where they are. And other times, it's that walking backward thing where you remember how you, you, you sort of replay what changed your pattern. But stress will keep you from that memory. So the first, you know, step number one is to not lose your keys is to realize that the majority of people are calling something memory when, in fact, it was a lack of attention. So they just didn't pay attention in that moment. They didn't come out of their own head and pay attention. Now, here's where it gets tricky. If that part of your brain, because of dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever, is starting to deteriorate, then it's a dual, you know, a double-sided edge here where sometimes it's because you didn't, you personally, you were busy, you didn't pay attention, and other times it's because you can't pay attention. There's a part of your brain that's starting to deteriorate, and this is usually in the parietal lobes. So when it's something that's related to spatial, when it's something that's related to items like that, like losing your car, losing your keys, losing your hat, I generally would put the sensor somewhere in the parietal or temporal junction near the, you know, where they come together and check to see if we have issues there. Sometimes you do it on both hemispheres, sometimes not. But by watching what's actually happening for someone and educating them on paying attention, and even so, they're still having trouble, they can't seem to hold this in their mind, then that leads me to sort of a next thought, which is even though I've given them some lifestyle changes, they don't seem to have the function ability to do this, so now I need to help with 
neurofeedback. Now, the truth is I do it simultaneously. I, I do all of this at one time. I'm just separating it out so you can understand it better. Um, so that's what I would do. I would, sort of, I, I would sort of say, figure out from talking to them and the kinds of problems they're having, is this spatially related memory? So where is the, the challenge probably in the brain biggest? Um, is it lifestyle-related memory? Is it, um, you know, I try to help them bring down their stress, do the things that you said. But when I'm using biofeedback, I follow based on what they tell me, not based on data and cues, because I find them a little more misleading. I love them as extra information. But behavior for me, and maybe it's the way I understand, is the easiest way for me to know what to do next. And so in this case, I, I could go on and on and on, but we don't have that no, it's, it's many, totally many hours. But in this case, I would do yeah. that. I tend to use a lot of uh, compensation. So if someone uh, forgets their keys, I'll compensate by having them put a notice up, you know, at the door, Did you, do you have your keys? Or if that doesn't work on the refrigerator, you know, and, and keep going until – what what I call uh, ohm power, which is overwhelming motivation, until they're overwhelmingly motivated not to forget their keys. And at that point, you can stop. But uh, the other thing you brought to mind was the fact that uh, it is about attention. And one of the big things that is making us smarter as humans is the computer and the Internet. But it's also uh, a problem because we're constantly multitasking. And I've noticed a lot of memory problems like losing the keys happen as we multitask. Right. You know, suddenly you think of two things, and that multitasking definition for me is doing two things badly. So, right. So that's the, uh, you know, the, just my, a little feedback. That, but it's so fascinating that you use that uh, brainwave biofeedback and neurofeedback, which I've heard about for memory, but I, I really don't. Uh, use it for that, and so I'm interested in in what you're saying, and and it's amazing, and I, you know, it yeah, seems it, like it's it's really fascinating. Another thing you can do is you can create that sort of multi-learning by doing a lot of different locations in the brain. So you're asking the brain; it's like making it in a gym, into a gym. So you can use biofeedback for the brain to sort of get areas of the brain working that weren't otherwise working very hard and got out of shape. And so you are able to do the enrichment much faster because it's a faster method than trying to do it in life and then encourage them to do it in life as well. Oh, my gosh, we're out of time. <laughs> oh, no. well, we have to do this awesome. again. I think memory is a big one for people, and I'd love to have you back another time if yeah, you're I'm game. Sure. Thank you so much. All right. So um, any, I, before we go, I want you to tell people how they can find you and, you know, like websites, that sort of thing. And then also one last, piece of, one last piece of advice or something special you want to say to people or a hello to your daughter, whatever you want to do. <laughs> Definitely hello to my daughter. She's my pride and joy. And she has a, a fabulous memory. She memorized 86 pages of The Cat in the Hat when she was two years old. Oh, so my. I think she, was a kid. she freaked me out. And uh, she's still doing stuff like that. Um, so I, you can find me through Memory Matters with a Z, as if I forgot to spell matters, which sometimes I do. And that's a .org. Uh, or South Florida Biofeedback, which is a .com. Or if you go on Facebook or LinkedIn, I moderate the, the biofeedback uh, user groups. And you can find me there. Um, I'm changing the spelling of my name to D-A-Y-V-E because no one can find Dave Newman. There's millions of Dave Newmans, it seems. It's <laughs> <Which, laughs> amazing, so I've decided to put a Y now. <laughs> so people can find me if they ask why. I'll tell them. Okay. Why. That's awesome. <laughs> and, and my phone is 914-434-8667. And uh, if you need help, call me, and I'll try my best. All right. Fantastic. What a great show. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Wow. Dave Newman. That was awesome. Dave. D-A-Y-V-E. All right. So that was a fun show. We got to really close this up quickly. I want to mention one thing, though, just because I think the brain brought us the Google gods. What the heck do you want to add to that? It was a pretty good show. So I'm just going to mention that very often Alzheimer's has been considered to be related to autoimmune problems. 
autoimmune problems are so on the rise. It's really, really a serious issue. Lots of the things that happen in dementia and Alzheimer's um, happen in autism, happen in, in ADHD, happen in... So this whole memory formation thing can maybe, maybe be seen as a... Um, sort of a, a little clue that we've got something going on in the autoimmune world. So I think that it's a good idea to keep that in mind. And the reason I say that is I did a little quick Google search, and apparently Stanford University found a cure for Alzheimer's disease, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, that's just the headline that's to make you click on it. You know how that goes. But there is some interesting stuff here. So it's about the micro, microglia function and the autoimmune um, issues, and I really want you to Google that because I don't have time now. I've got to close the show uh, to read it to you, but go ahead and Google uh, Stanford University Cure for Alzheimer's and see what, what comes up. It looks like a good read. Uh, go ahead and email me, mom number four evermore at juno, J-U-N-O dot com, if you have any opinions that you want to share about what you read. So that's your homework. And homework is important if you want to keep your brain strong and your memory happening. Watch out for the bad food. Foods, bringing down your immune responses. You won't have a brain to think with. All right, I'm Lynette Louise. I am the Brain Broad, and you've been listening to The Brain Broad Builds a Brain, where we believe that what you do builds your brain stronger or weaker. It's all up to you. Thank you for joining The Brain Broad Builds a Brain. To further connect with Lynette Louise, our award winning host, email her at lynettelouise.com. Build a brain, build a brain. Once you learn to do it, you were never the same. Build a brain, build a brain. On purpose! With Brain Broad. You'd look inside my heart and then you'd know The wonder of the beauty that I see Maybe then you'd believe in me If you could feel with my touch Good lives inside of me. 